colleague Stefan and I, we're here to talk about reactive, and in this case, reactive for the rest of us. The two of us, we were lucky enough, I guess in the past year or so, to be working with a team building the first reactive services um, ever, for most of them, actually. Um, and we hold it a little bit with uh, what Neil was saying in the morning, sharing some stories, right? This is maybe not as legend as what he was sharing, but who knows, it may become. Um, so we'll be talking about the journey that we went through with that team and the kind of challenges that we saw, um, the learnings that we think we've made along the way. And we especially think that this may be interesting for you because reactive is kind of becoming a new buzzword. It's been around for a while, fair enough, um, but we see it moving into more mainstream frameworks, most notably the Spring Framework. Um, and the adoption is a little bit, I'd say, like picking up slowly. So we're by no means reactive experts, um, but we have that journey to share. And I think, um, at least for us, we've made some learnings that will indicate a few of the reflections that we would be making if we were ever to start over again. Um, so that's kind of our starting point. So, um you might not, not know this, um, I'm Stefan, I'm not working with ThoughtWorks, I'm a client, I'm working at Otto. And um, because Otto is basically a big company in Germany, I guess most of you haven't even heard of it. <laughs> so I'll give you a short introduction of what the setting was. So we've been around for around 70 years, exactly 70 years. We're celebrating anniversaries this year. And so Otto started out with selling things by mail over a catalog. And then in 1995, we went online and have our own website. And I think it has been a pretty successful business for a while. We're still growing. We're making three million, or three billion, sorry, three billion euros a month of revenue. We're growing linearly. And we've seen a lot of competitors come and go. Some of them were swallowed by us. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, recently, we've discovered that we have competitors that have an exponential growth. And this is causing a problem because we need to stay relevant in the market. So um, we need to have a certain share of the market for customers to come to us, actually. Um, so we're thinking, so the strategy that, that Otto has adopted is um, to become a platform. And part of that platform is being a marketplace to broker customers and partners. And like partners can sell their goods to customers. And we just take a commission fee for, for that. So this would be a scalable business. And we realized that our legacy systems were not able to support that kind of business because, like, as I said, some of them are really old because we have 70 years of baggage. Um, so there was a new project started to develop this kind of marketplace. And we were part, like, we, we've been working together in one team of this project. And um, so we've got a mission in the end. So, um, we started more or less green field. However, this green field is set in, a, in, an, in this environment of a lot of legacy systems, so it's not totally green field. But we were implementing the order to cash process, and part of that for our team was to develop an application that can calculate basket prices and do some, yeah, some business logic on that. And since we're already having a website that is generating a lot of traffic, we've been expecting a lot of requests to this pricing service in the end. And also it's user facing, therefore we also assumed that we should have a very low latency because customers don't like waiting for the result of how much a basket is. This gave us an idea, like these were our assumptions when we started with this project. And this already gave us an idea what we could be facing. And then some smart person in our team came up with this term of this C10K problem. I don't know if everyone is aware of that. So this is a numer something. <laughs> that indicates um, the problem of serving a high number of concurrent requests. So in general, we've, we've had, uh, to add that to that, we had some, some constraints on what technology to use. And basically, one of these constraints was to use Spring Boot. And the classical Spring Boot approach to that, to, to serving web requests, is basically you take one request and you assign it to one thread. And this thread will then be blocked until the request is finally served. This works reasonably well unless you get a really high number of requests because then 
at some point you will create a lot of threads or need a lot of threads and they incur a penalty as in they use memory and also they need like if you have more threads than physical CPU cores then they will um, context switch so CPU will context switch a lot of times and this is also not ideally for performance mm. so we thought maybe this is not not the only way to go about that again same smart person said look at that spring has come up with a new model of, of processing those things a reactive model so this is called spring web flux another flavor of spring good or spring five so the idea is that you take every request that goes in it is uh, it is accepted by one thread in this reactive loop and this thread is non or this request is, be, is being processed non-blocking so this thread is immediately being freed after accepting the connection and then passed on to the um, other like for the layers behind of that processing and of course this doesn't take away like the the pressure of having a lot of requests they still need to be processed in a way and threads block for a reason usually um, but yet because of this model we can and, and reactive programming we can implement a back pressure so the application can handle the processes at the speed that feels convenient to handle and then therefore optimize its resource usage so that's the general idea and we felt quite compelled to it um, although we had some discussions with uh, tech principals also from ThoughtWorks who had some <laughs> some remarks or some doubts. <laughs> some doubts is maybe too strong a word so they advised us go programming in reactive would be a pretty steep learning curve and well the team was pretty eager to um, to use that technology but then again the future of auto is at stake with this project like we we need to be relevant we're not doing this for fun um, and therefore we still needed the, the team to somehow deliver something so we cannot just have the team pick shiny new technology for every aspect of what they're using or what, what they're implementing so we decided that we will have um, a concept of a, of a innovation token so we have one token that we can use on any technology that we feel like we want to explore and that we feel fitting and we will use that on Webflux and for the rest of the technology we will stick with rather conventional and proven solutions mm. and so after back and forth and to be honest this is opinionated and as Neil as Neil said this morning probably programming languages are very much um, personal taste so the team agreed to this architecture decision record I was about to say YOLO but um, <laughs> <laughs> but in the end so we recognized it might be a tough journey uh, yet we, we were curious in using this this technology and so we just went for it but because we've, we've been warned we said that we come back and revisit how it worked out for us and so um, we went on a journey yeah the journey so from here on we're going to take you through a rough timeline of that path right starting from somewhat in the beginning to somewhere around now ish um, and share the excitements and struggles and also the learnings along the way so we're around about June 2018 um, and we're all pretty excited about doing this thing you remember a bit of the doubts of more senior people we had that in the back of our Hats, but um, we were just starting our services, right? So they were fa fairly non-complex. Um, in the beginning, everything is simple, right? Um, and it felt like there are really just a few isolated concepts to learn because we all knew Spring Boot and the majority in Webflex still kind of, you know, is living in this ecosystem. And we thought, well, essentially reactive is about stream processing in an asynchronous manner. That sounds fairly you know, okay to process. Um, it's also not extremely new, right? You know, um, event buses and stuff like that, they're on the larger scale, a bit of a similar idea. So we thought, well, reactive, it's that idea on steroids, right? You just turn everything into a stream and then here you go. And really, like the first thing when you dive into that is you learn about reactive being a bit of like the observer pattern that most people at have been working in an OO paradigm. Uh, why a hard is kind of a thing that's also not very new. You add on top of that 
the idea of fact pressure. So what does that mean? You have a publisher that publishes or emits elements uh, as it goes, and you have subscribers that subscribe to that and then notified on every signal. Now, what happens if the subscriber gets, or the publisher publishes more e or events faster than the subscriber can consume those? Well, then that's bad luck for the subscriber and it probably will eventually go down. That's where the, like, the idea of back pressure sets in. So in the reactive world, the subscriber tells the publisher how much it can process. So far, so good. Then if you dive into WebFlux, there's basically two types. Like WebFlux is based on Reactor as the implementation of reactive streams. And it basically manifests in these two types. And the stream, at the end of the day, emits one of th three things at a time, either a value of some, some type, an error or a completed signal. And then the mono can do one element, and the flux does multiple of those. If you think of monos, or if you know a little bit of like the more recent Java, um, ecosystem, then uh, a, mon a mono is a bit similar to complete of a future, while a flux is kind of like a Java 8 stream with back pressure. Simple, right? So when we first started, and Stefan spoke about the basket processing, we're implementing this endpoint that's basically you know, accepting posts to a price endpoint with JSON in it, and then we sent this off to a handler function. So we have a router function that accepts that incoming request and set, uh, sends it on to the handler function. And then the handler function returns a mono and declares all the processing procedures, basically, that you want to do on that request. But it's pretty cool because that, you can take that basically out of every Reactor 101 tutorial, right? Fairly cool. We were very happy. It didn't seem such a big or a steep learning curve after all. We've been soon realized that our team was changing, there were new people coming in, but also the program, um, or the teams that were making up this program in the beginning, at some point needed, needed to integrate, right? So there was this checkout process that at some point, most of the teams at that point would want to integrate towards, but they were busy actually you know, making money while we were still before the release of our MVP, so priorities were kind of different in like what we were focusing on and what they were focusing on because they depended to, uh, or they were living in this already running system, um, making money in the web shop. So we decided to build a mock-up of that in order to prove some points of integrating, right? Like being able to co consume each other um, and integrate into where we eventually needed to integrate. So we built a thing that became known as the demo checkout page and our team took on the starting of that. So that was a re reactive service, of course, because we were just starting this interesting new thing. Um, and most people, as Stefan said, well, we were all supposed to build um, Spring Boot services, so they are all fairly familiar with the Spring ecosystem. And they were looking at our code, and they were like, doesn't quite feel like Spring, to be honest. Whereas like my controller annotations, Whereas like all the magic the spring does in your little router handler thing. Um, and they also didn't have much time to ramp up on that because they were doing their thing and that was basically just a side effect for them. So we went a few, or we spent quite a few hours cross team pairing to make sure this works. Um, and the more complex it became, the more overhead that bec became for our team. So we had to make a decision. And we went back to the beginning and realized that Spring was pretty aware of that fact and that they're trying to build upon the fact that the way things are done in Spring uh, is one of the assets, right? So it turns out there's a few things that you can actually do more in the traditional Spring way or in a more kind of like reactive pattern way. And in that case, there is the controller annotations um, or asynchronous implementations of those annotations that you can just leverage and use. So when you apply that to your code, you see something that looks fairly familiar to a Spring programmer, right? You have your REST controller annotation, your you know, mapping annotations. It pretty much looks fairly the same up until the point where you return your mono and you still have your, of course, your declared processing of how you handle um, your business logic. So far, so good, so that was saved. But then it turns out that's actually not the biggest challenge. That's just one of the side challenges. The biggest challenge at least 
at that moment to us is that Webflux forces you to think in a functional manner very much. And if you have a team that's mostly made up of people coming from a more imperative programming paradigm, this is more challenging than you might expect. So uh, the MonoFlux APIs basically give you um, all those functional uh, operations that you can do on them, right? It's like at the end is like a stream and you, you want to do some transformations on your stream. And you build that plan for execution later. You could say in Java 8 there's already some functional elements, right? Like we have Java 8 streams and there's also APIs that are a little bit like that. But when you think about it, at least that's our experience, that often ends in the fact that you do some occasional refactoring here and there, right? Where it fits, where you feel like it could be a little bit more uh, concise. It would just be a little bit nicer and cleaner if you did it that way. Well, in Webflux, you're not that free to choose. So just to briefly contrast the two things, in object orientation, you code with objects and you always think about state. And your end goal is to encapsulate that state and basically hide data internally um, and then communicate via messaging. In a functional paradigm, you want to expose that data so you can trans like build transformations upon them and be very declarative about that. In the spring world, these are not contradictory things, right? You know that from Java 8, but in Webflux is the same thing. You can do both at the same time, which, make, which some, sometimes makes it even harder right? because you need to know when to do what. What does that uh, pipeline of transformations look like? You basically, like in that case, imagine you have a flux of shipments and yet you have a flux of retailers and you want to build an invoice from the two, right? So somehow you need to bring them together. We're zipping them together and we're logging a little bit that we've just done that, created that invoice. We're flat mapping in order to update the state of those, like basically pass it on to our database and then we publish that same message to, for our others to process and we do some metric gathering and error handling at the end. That's all fairly nice, but you have to be very, very cautious of building side effects in that, because you totally can. And in a functional world, that's basically the starting point of the end of everything, right? Because if you do that too much, it becomes really, really hard to understand what your program is actually gonna do out of something, right? Because it's just hidden somewhere and you expect it to be uh, exposed and clear, but it's not, and then you know you, you lose sight of things. So that's a thing that happened to us. So this happened to us. So basically, we've learned a lot in the first few months of the project, but then time passed on, and deadline for going live went closer. And you know, projects there is um, actually almost too much scope, too little resources, too little time. So every team got a second task. And um, we were tasked to implement an invoicing application. And like, if you look at the requirements for that, requirements are completely opposite to that. It's more or less a backend system. Um, it doesn't really matter how fast we react. We only get one to create one invoice per order, basically, in the order of. Um, so all our reasoning of why to, to go for reactive programming didn't really hold true there. And we decided we would revise our decision um, if we want to go for Webflex again. In the end, we decided to, to keep this, uh, this technology in. And I, to be honest, this is not only because it worked so well. Like we, we've had our struggles with that, even with very basic things. And it took longer probably than we would have expected to do some things. But then, on the other hand, we felt like we were, we were discovering some, some advantage of this whole, uh, whole mm -hmm. thing, some, some unexpected advantage. You see this graph, and this is just stolen from GitHub from, 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 a, from a book that is really nice, about how the usual progress of a team in, in terms of reactive programming or in functional programming, sorry, functional programming is. So if you look at the readability of your code, and readability is one of the main properties of clean code, then it feels like it goes down first when you approach functional programming, and then at some point it picks up and you improve on your readability. But there is something that 
I personally call the valley of tears in between. <laughs> and it was like, it's really not that fun at the moment. Like you have yeah. something working and you don't improve it, you go the opposite and then go up again. But we felt like we were somewhere at this line. So we were as good as before and there was promise um, for this to be better or to improve even further. So we went again with, uh, with Webflux and this whole reactor. And also since this is a backend system, probably Webflux is not that much an issue anymore. It's more like reactor in itself. Like we were not processing that many web requests anymore. So at this moment, we were basically there. So this is again, some random piece of code from our project. And as Lisa already pointed out, you can see we're taking a web request here. We're converting it to a mono. Fine, this is a technical task, but then as I feel, or we feel this is um, pretty, pretty um, much expressing intent, basically feels like cleaner code to us. So you can see we're, we're having this class product mapper that is some, some external object that gets into our service. We convert it to our domain object. Then we publish the message of, about this product and then we do some error handling. So there's no, no how it works, it's just what needs to be done. And this felt really nice, nice at that moment. So we went with that, and again, we hit some problems. Yeah, I call this ways to make your life, life harder. So maybe it's half because it's a new technology or a new paradigm that we've used, and also because some, some things are more fragile than they, they were before. So go live date came closer, we did some kind of a big bang. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so the project went live at some point and we needed to get production ready. And we found ways to, to make our, our life harder. And so some of those problems were, for example, we wanted, wanted to add documentation about our, our uh, HTTP endpoints. And of course, we'd use Swagger for that. We tried this before with the first approach with this um, at, at configuration classes. Right. And Swagger didn't support that at the time. I don't think it still does. So this was kind of a surprise. Luckily, we've switched to, to, the, um, to the classical REST controller approach by, by then. So it worked fine. Also, for feature toggles, this was kind of a surprise. Of course, feature toggles, uh, toggle, the toggles framework worked well in itself. No problem there. And it has a very beautiful uh, web console where you can switch on toggles and can, can um, schedule this. Um, Unfortunately, this doesn't work with, web, uh, only works with, with web MVC and not with web flux. So our application really has an HTTP endpoint where you can query with a curl or whatever for your toggle state. So this, is, this will catch up in, in, in some time, but still made us a bit bummed at that moment. And it's not just the ecosystem. We've also managed to, to shoot ourselves in the foot sometimes. So for example, like the first example, dot block. So if you, if you have a mono object, so you get your scenario is, you, you have your entity and it's somehow wrapped in a mono and you're a, an imperative programmer and it's the first time you, you encounter this thing and you want to do something with your entity. You wouldn't think of map, you want to extract this, your entity from the mono. And one way to do this is to call dot block which then waits for this event, for, for, this, um, for this publisher to, to complete. And then you can do whatever you want with your plain object. And this works fine. It compiles, you can deploy it to live, even in your, in your controller. And then you get a request to that controller and it does an assert, which crashes your whole application because you shouldn't do that because it's breaking the reactor. Um, happened, <laughs> was funny, it was easily fixed, but um, yeah. Also, um, we've did, we, we um, did some scenario on, uh, on what happens when you subscribe your, your publishers on the main thread pool that's taking the requests. And basically, you're recreating the scenario you have with classical web MVC. So every thread is blocked for until it's served the request. And, um, but you have less threads, so this is worse. And one last point that was really hard and still is, is debugging because um, debugging really is different in Reactive because you get different stack traces with a lot of reactor code and little of your own domain code. So anyway, we managed. We still have some of those problems, but we went live. And the good thing is nothing happened. It just went smoothly. So application is running, it's mature, it's fine. And um, 
Yeah, and that's it basically, right, Lisa? Pretty much. Unless you successful, successfully deliver on your MVP, and then your pro program management comes around and says, well, that's great. Let's scale that thing. Because, you know, we want to make money. We want to make this bigger. So I think we went from a bit slowly, but then also very fast at the end, from starting with three teams. So I think now it's considered 21 teams that are somewhat involved. And for our team specifically, that meant um, a distributed setup. So all of a sudden, we were bringing in, I think, two new people in India, on the other side of the world, into our team and having to ramp them up on a service that's already, or a system that's already live, building new features on top of that. So we we're kind of like, okay, so we had quite some time to go through all that pain and you know, do all learnings and stuff. Unfortunately, they won't. So what do we do? Like, how can we speed up this process? How can we make sense of the learnings? Um, and pretty much what we've told you just now with a little bit more detail, of course, um, we try to trans transfer efficiently as possible. Now, if you go out and just browse the web and try and find learning resources, what you usually find is with, I think, most technologies, actually, or maybe I'm just too bad at Googling, but you find a Hello World, like a tutorial very thoroughly on how to build a, a Hello World ap application. And then you find all kinds of things about specific problems and details and whatnot. But there's a big gap in between. And we found it fairly hard, especially in this world where there isn't so much adoption yet, to find good material to learn from just by like going through it, right? So what we did is we were trying to like gather all the reading material or at least what we could think of at that moment in time that the team had used in somehow of a productive manner, right? Whatever served the team to go to some place, we kind of like built up this collection of resources. Um, but then we also found like we need a bit more of an eclectic kind of bringing stuff together and running people through it, workshop type thing. So here you can see our colleague Klaus up in the corner running a remote workshop with our team in Hyderabad about A, the basics of reactive programming and Reactor and Webflux and you know, all the, let's say, like the first steps into that world, a little bit about functional mindset and you know, um, immutability of data and all the things that had we had uh, shot ourselves in the foot with. Um, and then also going a bit deeper in the second part with like more advanced um, principles and, and debugging, a lot of debugging. Um, so that's what, that was a good starting point to like at least build up a mental model. But then really, you only learn doing stuff by doing it, right? Um, and luckily, we were doing uh, pair programming as a, a standard day-to-day -day practice, so that helped a lot. We tried to be much more conscious on like, you know, matching pairs in the beginning, so we had people with a little bit more exposure and people with a little bit less exposure to pairing together more frequently. Um, we also came up with a set of katas to go through, so people could do that at night, at home, but also together as like, a learning exercise. And then I think last but not least, um, what we're still trying to do as a principle is whenever you run into a bit of a more newer or a problem that kind of seems harder to you, try and take that to a mob programming session. It's like a tech huddle where you actually get together with the entire team and solutionize together. So yeah, that's, that's the things that we did and we feel like that helped speed up the, the learning curve. Um, but then I guess with all that journey that we told you, the question remains is like, what would you do that again, right? And since the answer is always it depends, what does it depend on? First and foremost, I guess that was probably clear to us, it's training your functional mindset. So be aware that reactive programming, at least in that world, brings in a functional approach through the back door if you want so, like if you're not aware of that um, to begin with. And if you have a team that's not necessarily exposed to that, because of course there's teams that do nothing but functional programming um, outside of reactive, then you know, calculate in that this may take some ramp up time. Also remember the innovation token. If that's the case, make sure that you use boring technology all around this. Otherwise, you're just gonna not get anything done. Expect the ecosystem to still catch up. Even though it's been around for a while, I think Spring 5 was released in 2016, um, 
since the adoption isn't that large yet, and I think that just the requirements of services generally aren't necessarily indicating a use of uh, reactive programming so often, the ecosystem just takes more time to build up than we had expected. Be very intentional about learning. I think in the beginning we thought we kind of do learning as a side effect. It's like you always learn new stuff, right? Like how hard can it be? It can be really hard and you can break it dramatically. So be very intentional about that and um, set, be sure that you can set some time aside for that. And also a team will always change, right? So this is a continuous thing. It will stay around for a while until this may or may not become more of a standard paradigm. And then yes, you are going to break it or at least we did. I mean, I don't know, maybe you're just much smarter than we are, but we did break it <laughs> in many ways. Um, and since debugging is so hard, um, make sure that you, um, that you at least notice when that happens. Because there's a few ways of breaking reactive where you wouldn't necessarily realize up until the point where your load actually goes up and you're actually required to use you know, all, all the, um, the characteristics that you were building for and then you realize, well, you know, subscribing on the main thread pool it, it's kind of not really working out that well. Um, so yeah, try to find ways to make it visible when it breaks. And I guess with that, we say thank you to our team, which name is Dragonfish, so, and thank you for, for listening.